Luke 6. Going to start there. We're live? All right. We are live. Well, that's, that's a good thing. Good evening, everyone. Great to have you joining us. If you are in this room or if you are in some other room, it's nice to have you joining us. So uh, great to have you with us and great to be able to break break open the Word of God together as uh, we continue this study of blessed to be a giver and uh, not ashamed of it. It's the blessing of God. It's the plan of God and it works quite great. So in Matthew chapter 6, we, I'm sorry, Luke, Luke chapter 6, verse 38, says something like this, and I have the New Living Translation. You may want to share one of your translations. I know you have some others, but if you give, you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full measure, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, and running over. Whatever measure you use in giving, large or small, it will be used in measure what is given back to you. Now, who has a different translation? Yep. NIV. NIV? Okay. Here they know it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. All right. So that was the NIV. Uh, that's a little more like the King James I grew up with. Given it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, it shall be given unto you. Okay. Very good. So um, we have been looking at what the Word of God says about giving, and we have looked at different scriptures from the Old Testament, kind of look at a foundational base of tithing. Last week we were in Malachi, if you were with us last week, and we were looking at Malachi chapter 3, where God made a charge to Israel and said that uh, you've been robbing me. And they seemed to be shocked by that, uh, didn't seem to uh, uh, be aware or at least uh, want to acknowledge that that was the case. But in, uh, in chapter 3, uh, verse 7, 8 following, should people cheat God? You have cheated me, but you ask, what do you mean? Uh, you have cheated me of the tithes and offerings, tithes and offerings. In the Word of God, we have tithes, we have offerings, and there are also uh, alms. You'll find alms mentioned being given as well. In Malachi specifically, it's addressing tithes and offerings. And verse 9 says, you're under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Uh, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my uh, house, my temple, if you do so, says the Lord, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Let me prove it to you. Last week we talked about that, that this passage is one clear place in the entirety of the Word of God where God says, put me to the test. Test me in this and see. And, of course, uh, he's speaking directly to his people. Now, when we go from... This passage in Malachi that's dealing with tithes and offerings where God is saying, you're robbing me. And then we come into Luke chapter 638 and this scripture that's very familiar, given it shall be given unto you. Sort of sounds like, you know, give whatever you want to and just understand there's a principle that as you give, you're going to receive back. And so we read that and uh, there are other scriptures that we're going to take note of tonight in the New Testament that are biblical principles that have to do with a heart of giving, the principles of giving. But I want to start by clarifying this, this point. Um, giving in obedience to God in regards to tithing is already laid out exactly what that means. And so it's not up for discussion how much of the tithe is the tithe? The tithe is the tithe. It's 10%. And yet there are many who teach in reference to giving in New Testament, and they apply principles that have to do with other forms of giving to tithing as, as if it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. 
because the tithe belongs to God. So God claims ownership of it. God says it's mine. God says you rob me if you don't give to me. So when we look at a scripture such as uh, Luke 6, 38, this sort of sounds like, well, that's a pretty nice scripture. That sounds like I can give to get. <laughs> and I've heard some messages that sort of went that way, that, uh, you know, you, you should give um, with the expectation of uh, getting in return. Well, God is a generous God, and sure. God's desire is to bless his people, and you can read about that from the beginning as God's talking to his people in Deuteronomy where he wants to bless, wants to make us the head and not the tail, and that's give us good health and for our children to be blessed, for our crops to be blessed, and for every aspect of our life to have God's favor on it. Um, however, when it comes to the area of, uh, of giving, have you ever just wondered, is that the right kind of a heart to give? First of all, even if you could give to get, it wouldn't be the tithe because that's not yours. You're just returning to God what is His. You're showing reverence, and we have looked at that. You remember the scripture we were looking at in Deuteronomy 14, where it, it says there um, that doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God. The tithing is a principle that teaches us to trust, to rely upon, and respect God and His Word. And uh, that's very clear as a principle. So, as a principle, if the 10% is already God's, then when we talk about giving and receiving as a principle of generosity or some of these other principles we're going to look at, we need to separate the giving out of obedience in tithing and the giving out of a generous heart. I mean, there's a lot of good things you can give to, and you can give alms, and you can give offerings, and you can give to the uh, to the food banks and to all kinds of different things. But we need to make sure that we're not mixing up those things and we're not calling a gift to the guy that's sitting on the corner our tithe. That's not your tithe. If you want to give him a buck or buy him, I'd encourage you to buy him a sandwich and pray with him and not just give him a buck. He'll probably, uh, you know, buy something that you'd rather he not buy. I mean, I've even seen some signs where the signs up says, uh, you know, need a drink. And uh, one guy told me, he said, I would almost rather give money to that guy because it sounds like at least he's honest. Maybe God can work with an honest drunk. But uh, in any case, that probably is not the best use of the Father's resources. That's between us and God. So the, the tithe is one thing. Uh, in obedience, we just honor God with what is His. And so now in the New Testament, we're going to look at some of these other scriptures tonight, and this is one of them. And in regards to giving and receiving, um, do you believe it's right to have a heart to say, okay, God, I, I gave an offering of $50. Now I'm looking for a 30-fold or a 60-fold or a 100-fold return. And, uh, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to hold you to it. And I told you the story about the family that said, I tried tithing, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. yeah. They tried it for a few months, it didn't work. Well, today they're tithers, and they figured out that God works. God honors his word. So they came back to that after a number of years, and they wanted to make sure I knew about that, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear that today. Um, but if we are looking to manipulate God, through giving, or through prayer, or through fasting, the Pharisees were very religious, and they did all these things. They did them with regularity. But Jesus made it real clear that our righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, they, they did a lot of things that were good, and they taught a lot of the Torah, but their hearts were just not right and upright and righteous before God. Now, we know there were a good number that would end up believing in Christ and became followers, and so there were those that uh, had a change of heart. Proverbs chapter 3, we looked at this um, already, so I'm just going to read it to you. Honor the Lord with your wealth 
and with the best part of everything you produce. And there again, that's talking about uh, the first fruits, etc. Then he will fill your barns with grain, and your vats will overflow with good wine. That is a promise from God. You honor God uh, with uh, the first fruits with your, with your tithe, speaking specifically of the tithe. Now we come to the uh, New Testament, and we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. Pastor? Yes. Just before you go there. Sure. Um, when you were reading um, Luke 638, uh -huh. don't, don't we have to take it into context with 37? Verse sure. Mm -hmm. about judge not, condemn not, but forgive and you will be forgiven, and then give and it will be given. Mm -hmm. there's yeah, there's, there's a whole seven. series. There's a whole series of verses there okay. that, I mean, earlier, love your enemies. Look at verse 35. Mm -hmm. Love your enemies, do good to them. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other principles, obviously, that, that tie in. Lend to them. Mm -hmm. To who? Your enemies? You're going to lend to your enemies? Yeah. And don't be concerned that they may not repay you. Ah. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of good stuff there that has to do with finance and has to do with management that does not make sense unless... We understand that God is our provider and that God is the one that's given us everything we have anyway. I don't believe it's suggesting we be reckless. I believe it's suggesting that we live with an open hand and not with a tight fist um, to, uh, to be generous. And, and we're going to see some of these principles. Your reward will, will be very great in heaven. You'll truly be acting like children of the Most High God. Thank you, Esther. Good point. So, uh, Include some of these other verses probably, uh, you know, in, in that chapter, at least going back to verse 32 of Luke chapter 6. All right, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, going to begin reading with verse 1, and I want you to sort of focus on this, and I have some underlines, and you can't see the underlines, so uh, when, uh, when we come back to it, I'll make mention of those areas that I have underlined. Now, regarding your questions about the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. Galatia. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers you choose to deliver your gifts to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. Now, um, I have underlines under some points that I want to speak to. The first point I want to speak to is this part of the verse, verse 2, on the first day of each week. So I want to just give this word. Our giving should be with regularity. Regularity. You could say consistency, but regularity. Um, and this is the principle that Paul's laying out. It should be given with regularity. On the first day of each week. Well, the first day of each week is what day? Sunday. It's Sunday, right. So uh, it was not on their Shabbat, it wasn't on uh, their Sabbath, but it was on the, the first day of the week. So on the first day of each week, so giving is, uh, the guide is to give with regularity, you should put aside a portion. No, I didn't read everything that's there. You should each, each put aside a portion. Each one is to be a giver. Every part of the church. Each one. So that is an individual admonition. Just like with tithing, you have increased. And so everyone is to be a part of laying aside of the offering. So we have regularity. We have individuality. Every one of us, individually. And then we see that we are to uh, each, you should each put aside a portion. What does portion mean? It means a part of, a part of. Well, um, then we can say that 
a New Testament principle is, because Paul, what did he say? He said, in regarding your question about the, the money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. So this is a principle that Paul has been teaching in the other churches. It's not just in this church. It's a New Testament principle that he is laying out and he's giving. And so we have on the first day of the week, that's regularity. We have each of you should, this is individually, and then we have should put aside a portion, a percentage of, and so we have the giving in proportion. And, of course, we've talked about that over the, the previous weeks. And then uh, a, a portion of the money you have earned. So this is, is definitely the income. This is speaking in regards to income. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, now, now look at verse 3. When I come, I will write letters of recommendation. What do you think he's talking about? This, I believe, brings us to another level that deals with accountability. You remember in, uh, when we were reading in Leviticus, we're reading in the Old Testament about the tithe, that the tithe was to be brought to the Levites. Every third year it would be taken into the local town. But it's brought in, and the Levites then were responsible. They were to tithe to who? The high priest. And then the high priest at the temple, they had a storehouse. The local community where the tithe was taken in to the Levites, they were overseers of the storehouse in those communities to take care of who? The widows, foreigners, and of course this would include uh, you know, families like orphans and such forth. It would address to those with needs. And there were specific guidelines on how they were to harvest so that these individuals were not just on some social system, but they actually would go out and gather for themselves, like in the story of Boaz and Ruth, where you see uh, Ruth is out in the field doing what? Gleaning, gleaning, picking up be behind the harvester. And so this, this is part of the plan that God put in place. And so in, in verse 3 and 4, where Paul addresses this and says, when I come, I will write letters of recommendation for the messengers that you choose. He is saying to the local churches that as local congregations, there is, there is an autonomous ability to determine who you trust, to take your gift, your offering that you're going to take back to Jerusalem, and I will write a letter to send along with them that just gives credentials to what they're already going to be doing, and then he raises this as an additional option. If it seems appropriate for me to go along, in other words, if you would feel more comfortable with having additional accountability in the delivery of your offerings that you're going to send. Now, they're already in a community going to be selecting who's going to do it based upon their relationship with these people. They're going to be sending them. Paul said, I'll send a letter. But if, if it seems appropriate to you, they can travel with me and we'll go up together. And so you will have double assurance that what you intend to have happen with your resources, that it actually gets to Jerusalem and is able to, uh, to take care of the needs that are there. And so um, there isn't anything wrong with not just expecting, but also being a part of the local body establishing checks and balances and administrative oversight so that what takes place with the resource, I mean, we have business meetings. Anyone can ask a question about anything, anytime. I don't know, do, in the bulletins, do you put in what comes in the offering still? Is the that calendar. Oh, the calendar. It's in the calendar. Exactly. So anyone in this congregation can ask anytime you want to ask about anything. Our books are always open. And uh, they're always kept current. And so a church's book should be that way. And as a part of the congregation and mutual accountability, I believe it's appropriate for you to ask any question that you have, and you have every right to do so, and uh, to see to it that the resources that are given are actually utilized in a way that they were directed to be given. 
and we see that accountability in this passage. Any questions about these scriptures? You're probably somewhat familiar with them. Okay. Um, all right, so principles. These are some principles. We have give with regularity each week. We have give individually, and that is each person, each individual. I was taught as a child, even when I received money for Christmas, to tithe on what I received. And uh, sometimes it was coins. We had aunts and different relatives that would uh, give us small change. Uh, and and I, we were taught as children to, to give on that. Well, the day comes when, you know, you're an adult and you have to make those decisions. You don't have parents saying, okay, cough up a dime out of every dollar, you know, and do that. And as a child, I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't have much money. I wanted to hang on to my money. I felt like, no, that's mine. That was given to me. That wasn't given to God. My aunt did not send that to the church. She sent that to me. And uh, that's the way I felt about it. And I believe a lot of people still feel that way. Well, I work for this. What right does God have to lay any claim to what I have? And uh, so there are many people that simply have not been taught, maybe, or may simply not understand the principles of the Word of God, wherein God promises to take care of our needs according to His riches in glory. If we will entrust ourselves to Him first and then trust Him with what He has given us as well. So we have uh, each week giving with regularity, each one giving individually. We have uh, giving in proportion to what is earned. And this comes back to the whole concept when we look at the tithe or we look at the portion. Put aside a portion. Um, a giving with accountability. And I believe it's appropriate to uh, have some sense. If you know, uh, you know the leadership are a bunch of crooks, you probably should not be uh, in that congregation. I mean, and if you find out something isn't right or you are concerned about something, um, you have every right to ask questions. And I, I believe that is appropriate. Okay? Now, there are some other principles that we will see, and um, I would like to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and see if we can find any principles in this passage. 2 Corinthians 8, we're going to go to verse 11, 2 Corinthians 8, 11 and 12. Now you should finish what you started. Let the eagerness you showed in the beginning, so they had taken up offerings at an earlier time, and those had been uh, dispersed, received. Um, let the eagerness you showed in the beginning be matched now by your giving. Give in proportion to what you have. Now, I don't want to ride a hobby horse here, but I want to just tell you I'm going to underline those words. Give in proportion to what you have. Whatever you give, verse 12, is acceptable if you give it eagerly or cheerfully or joyfully. If you give it with the right heart, it is, it is acceptable, whatever. And give according to what you have. Here it is again. Give according to what you have and not what you don't have have. Now, maybe some of you have been blessed to never have an appeal put to you, such as some appeals that I have heard and I have sat under. But I have heard leaders in the church say, write that check out in faith, even if you don't have the money, put that check in the mail, put this on your charge card, uh, believe God, sow some seed, even if you don't have... I believe a biblical principle is laid out in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 that we're to give out of what God gives to us. And we are not to make obligation simply based upon some preacher's call for you to give. Um, that's why a faith pledge... Now, at this radio station, we're going to be taking faith pledges. A faith pledge is what you would like to give, and you're going to believe God to enable you to give. And you're not just calling in saying, I'm going to give a million dollars. 
Now, I'd love to somebody, for somebody to call in and say, I'll give a million dollars to Abundant Life, or I'll give a million dollars to WCNO Radio. I'd like for somebody to do that. But you know as well as I do, if someone says that, and God didn't put that on their heart, and they do not have the means to do it, then I can put that into my little book and say, okay, we now as a ministry are going to start planning to expand and do things based upon that commitment of that gift. That would be quite foolish, don't you think? And yet many ministries have got into tremendous trouble by doing that very thing. Wherein they have said, oh, well, you know, we, we have all these faith promises. Well, as the faith promises come in, then you can move. But it's, um, I believe it's a very dangerous thing to ask people to make commitments that they do not see any way by faith or even by physical means to fulfill. Now, if someone... And this is an interesting thing that happens. I see a lot of people's donations as they come in and out of here. We have um, well over a thousand, several thousand, many thousand families that um, are, have given at some point to this ministry. And of course, in the church, we have over the, the years as well. And occasionally, we will receive a donation that may be something like uh, $18.49. And you go, Huh? I mean, even when I'm pumping gas, I like it to stop on even numbers. You know, I'll be like, eek, eek, oh, no, you know, it, it went over two cents. So, yeah, yeah, or that's, that was the next thing I was going to say, or else I want to just squeak it on up to a quarter, so at least, you know, I, I kind of feel better about that. I don't know what. So I, I, was, uh, I was in the studio with uh, one of our uh, programs, and uh, he's a, a CPA, and uh, he was with us. Uh, I believe that was on our one of our last uh, days of fundraising. Maybe it was the last one. But some donations came in like that, and he said, I know exactly what that is. That is someone who has taken a percentage of their income. You know, they, he said, I'm sure they do it with their tithe, and they have a percentage of their income that is discretionary, that they have set aside, that they use for offerings, for ministries or other things. Now, probably most of you in this room give to other things other than just your tithe to the church. And I, my wife and I, we do as well. Karenet is just one of those things that, uh, that we give to. And we, we are led of the Lord to do that. We're able to do that. And um, the Word of God doesn't say we have to do it. We're not under obligation to do it unless the Holy Spirit directs you. And the Holy Spirit has put on our hearts. We, we feel led of the Lord to do that. And so if the Lord directs you to do something like that, then, then amen. And uh, now just a little more than a year, we've been giving to Teen Challenge to sponsor one of the Teen Challenge uh, uh, individuals. And, of course, that's a partial sponsorship, too. Well, that's not a requirement. There's nothing in the Word of God that says you have to support Teen Challenge or you have to uh, finance an orphan child that's in Africa or India, and we've given to different things like that over the years, and to different other ministries we, we give. And most of these, I prefer that they're just set up to be an automatic deduction. You know, every month it just comes up, bloop, it comes out, it goes out there, it's taken care of. And then at the end of the year, I can go back and check and say, okay, this took place. And once in a while, I'll get a note from someone that I've been giving to, and the note will say something like, uh, uh, your gift this month was uh, refused, or, or, uh, or it was not uh, available or something. And then I, oh, that's right, because there was some scandal, and the credit card company changed uh, my card, and so then it cuts it off so that, you know, it's not going to happen. But um, probably all of us in this room have given to other things other than tithes, so we understand that. And so those are areas of offering. But what we give to those areas, we give as God has provided to us. Now, there's another area that... Um, um, maybe some of you give, I know some of you do, and that's to the building, to the construction of the church. 
And someone may say, well, I want to give my tithe to build the church. I feel like that's what I should do. And, um, you know, I don't know where the gift is coming from or what it's for. If it's marked tithe, I don't look at those things anyway. The ladies do that. But um, if, if there is a gift to the building fund, that never is my tithe. We never take our tithe and put that into the building fund. Uh, we always give our tithe, and then we give what we give to the building. And with the building, the same as anything else. A few years ago, God put on our heart to give a certain amount of money, and, uh, and we committed to that. And it's, I think we're in year seven of giving to fulfill that desire that God put in our heart. And this year, I believe we will complete it. And so uh, already God's talked to me about the next commitment that he wants us as a family to trust him to give to the building. Why? Because I believe in reaching this community. I believe that's important. But that is not my tithe. So though that is a significant part of our giving, in fact, thank you, Lord, we're able to give to the building fund much more than we used to give in tithe. And, and we may not always be able to do it. God may not always provide in this way, but at this time he is. So there may be seasons of your life where you give to missions in a greater way, maybe a little lesser way, but the tithe is to meet the local needs of the priesthood and of the leadership in fact, I was in Israel with a Messianic leader, and in their congregation, they forbid any of the tithe to go to any operations. Now, in our congregation, our tithe actually goes to maintain things such as, well, we do have water and sewage. You wouldn't know it, do you? You go out to the land, you're not going to find a place to flush the commode. But we are already paying for water and sewage on our property, right, hon? Yeah, for over a year. We've been paying to flush the commodes, though we don't flush the commodes yet. <laughs> so uh, the tithe is actually, when you give the tithe, the tithe is actually going toward that. The tithe also is, uh, in a large part, paying the bonds, which is providing the resources, some of the resources for the construction project, and also um, the gifts that are supplemented on the communion table. We have that increase, remember, from the farm and said, let's just give God an opportunity to add an increase. It, it's just an offering, as God may, may direct. And Ruddy, you spoke to it several times. And I don't know how much comes in there. I, some comes in. It varies. But God put an amount on our heart, and we just give that from week to week. And that's a blessing. So we've been able, thanks be to the Lord. If you're in the business meeting, you know that our congregation has been able to maintain, we pay the rent for the place where we are, we also pay storage uh, on two units that keeps going up in price, right, dear? And it's climate controlled, not air conditioned, but climate controlled. And there's a nice grand piano and a bunch of chairs and a bunch of office equipment and desks and all kinds of stuff stacked from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall. And uh, we're looking forward to the day where we can unpack this stuff. But what I'm saying is when, when you give of of your tithe, the tithe that comes into the church at this point is paying salaries. It's also paying insurance policies. It's also paying, um, making sure that the rent is paid month to month, making sure the storage is paid month to month, and that the bond payments are paid month to month. And so all of these things are maintained from the income in the church. Some years ago, a man showed up on a, I think it was a sat, it was a Saturday, I'm sure, uh, when we were in Central Parkway, and he was just walking down the street, saw the church sign, and came up to the car and and said, uh, "I need a ticket," and I don't know where he wanted to go, someplace bus ticket. I need money for a ticket, and so you know I'm listening to the guy, and um, I'm asking a little bit because I don't just trust what people say. I'm sorry. People come out. They say all kinds of things. And um, so the, the long and the short of it, the longer I talked to this guy, the less confidence I had in helping him out. 
And at one point, he became not violent, but aggressive in communication. And he said, you have to buy me a ticket. I said, I do? He said, yeah. He said, you're a church. A church has to do this. A church has to buy me a ticket. You have to help people that, that come to you for help. And so, um, you know, I, I already knew he wasn't working. He was very capable of working. He could have worked day labor. I've worked day labor. I mean, I know what it is to ride a motorcycle to West Palm because you made $15 working all day. Because it, back then, minimum wage uh, was almost nothing, and that was the only place I could find day, day labor. So I had a motorcycle, uh, you know, put my uh, few, few cents worth of gas into the thing, rode it to West Palm, worked every day to make some money. And so when someone comes up and strikes me as having a lazy streak that's two miles wide, I'm not necessarily going to be motivated to do something but to say, let me help you get a job. Now, if you want to work, we put a lot of people to work over the years. He didn't want to work. He didn't want to do any of that. And so I ended up, he said, well, could you take me? He wanted me to take him someplace where he felt like he could, you know, maybe get on his way. So I said, I, I will take you there. And, and while we were, were driving, uh, I, I, guess, I guess maybe this is my flesh, you can pray for me. But uh, he was still arguing with me that every church ought to help every person with anything they come up and demand. And so I, I asked him this question, and this may have been a, a little bit of my flesh. I said, if, if the church had the amount of money that you've given in the last year, how many people would be helped in the church? I said, no, just you. No, other people. I said, I'm talking about you. You came here saying that the church has to give you whatever you want. I'm asking you a question. If, if, if what was available in the church was what you had given to God, what would be available in the church to give to someone else? Well, you shouldn't be asking me a question like that. I said, why? Why? I said, well, let me just ask you this. Have you given anything to God in the last year? Anything to God? Well, that's not a fair question. I said, why is that not a fair question? He said, because you know the answer. And I did know the answer. And so, um, you know, there are a lot of things that we can give to, but as a pastor, as a church, um, it's a blessing. I mean, Bree received a wonderful offering from our congregation. What was it, $900 or eight, eight $900, something like that. And um, missions right now. We, we're getting ready to deposit the third check for Panama missions. And those checks have been just right at about $500 that we, and we're looking to really lift their arms up this year. And so your faithfulness, that is a huge thing. But we don't give our tithe to that, though we do give to support that. So um, when we're looking at the principles, New Testament principles, we have this principle of giving in proportion to what you have and give according to what you have, not what you don't have. So I want to just say this. Romans 8 says, there is therefore now no condemnation. I've been in money-raising events where I felt manipulated emotionally to do something more than I had the peace of God to give. In fact, I didn't have the peace of God. I lost the peace of God. I felt like this, this dishonors God. There's a scripture, Bob, that you and Esther shared some years ago. Uh, in the day of God's favor, the people are what? Willing. They're willing. In the day of God's favor, the people are willing. If God moves your heart to do something, then be moved to the Holy Spirit. But I pray that you never, I pray that you never see me seeking to manipulate God's resources into anything that God has called me to do. If God directs you, amen. I'll make the request known. That's biblical. I'll lay it out before you. I may even say, this is what it's going to take for us to get to this next point. This is what our understanding of the need is. We may lay that out before you. 
But if you feel like you're being manipulated or I'm manipulating anyone, I want you to come to me or one of the elders. Some people say, well, I can't come to you. I, I, you know, you, you, you might give me a hard time. Then go to Bob. Let Bob come and give me a hard time. But I, I'm, I'm saying this honestly. I believe the church has lost credibility with a lot of business people because the church has handled money in a way that was not appropriate at some times. And so uh, I don't know how you all feel about that, but that's the way I feel about it. And I believe the Word of God needs to be the standard. So I'm not going to ask you to close your eyes and, uh, you know, <laughs> give or write out a blank check. I'm not going to ask you to do that. All right, let's go to another, another scripture. Um, and this is in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We were just in chapter 8, chapter 9. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 11. But I'm sending these brothers to be sure you really are ready, as I have been telling them, and that your money is all collected. I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. Now, Paul, Paul, when he's, you know, when he's talking to people, sometimes he'll say things like, uh, you know, like a, a Nesimus, when he's sending a letter about a Nesimus, a runaway slave. Paul ends up saying, uh, you know, I, I trust that you receive this slave back and that you put whatever he owes to my charge. And just remember that uh, you owe your very life to me. Now, that's kind of strong. But what Paul was saying was you came into the kingdom of God because of the ministry and the message that God brought through my life. And so I'm challenging you to honor your relationship with God and your relationship with other people. Strong message. Nothing wrong with a strong message. But... I, I do not like manipulation and control. I believe that that should not be involved in the house of God. And so we would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all that I have told them. Ah, well, Paul's saying, you know, you already have told me this was going to happen. Make sure that you're ready when we get there so that you're not embarrassed <laughs> when we show up with these other brothers. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a, what kind of a gift? Willing, Willing gift. Willing. NIV says generous. Generous. Willing, generous, not one given grudgingly, or what does the NIV say? Grudging. Grudgingly. A willing gift, a generous gift, not one given grudgingly. And so, we, we find a couple more principles we've been talking about. Our gift is to be given joyfully. Our gift is to be a generous, willing gift that we give. If it is other than the tithe. The tithe, we know what that's to be already, right? So you go, how, how can I be generous in giving my tithe if it belongs to God? Well, this is talking about all the other things you can give to. <laughs> you know, as God directs you, that uh, as Christians, we should be known as generous people. And, and that's a good thing. You know why? Because our God is generous to us. And so I want it to be a willing or generous gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get what kind of a crop? Small, Small crop. But the one who plants generously will get what? A generous crop, greater harvest. So you must decide in your heart how much to give. Now, I want you to look at that and understand that this is where many people teach that tithing is not a part of New Testament belief and practice. They'll say, well, it says, Paul says right here that you must decide in your own heart how much you uh, are going to give. I decide to give nothing. That's what I decided in my heart. It's not talking about the tithe. It's talking about the condition of our heart. It affects everything we do, even our tithing. But it's not talking about tithe. It's talking about offerings that's being given, you know, to Jerusalem or some other Christians that's been taken up. It's talking about alms and offerings. It's not talking about the tithe. And don't give reluctantly 
The New Living Translation says, or in response to pressure. Compulsion. Compulsion. That sort of comes right in line with what I've been sharing tonight, does it not? Don't let somebody arm wrestle you, you know, or uh, <laughs> the jokes in one of the minister's magazines, off and on they'd have these jokes about uh, giving, a lot of jokes about giving. But one was about the ushers, uh, you know, having... Uh, uh, vacuum hoses and walking along, cleaning out the per, you know the pockets as they went along, or like a a, a church that uh, that I was in at one time, where uh, the admonition was everybody stand up so you can get into your wallet, you know it'd be easier for you to get it out, get into your purse, get in there, get in there right now, you know take out take take out a generous offering. Uh, it, it's spelled T H O U S A N D. I even heard that in one message, and uh, there was some humor in it, and and that particular person was being somewhat humorous with it, and and I understand that many times pastors don't even want to talk about this because people can get so grumpy when you talk about giving, and that's simply because they don't understand and they have not understood the faithfulness of God. Pastor? Yes. Uh -huh. God loves a cheerful giver. It didn't say a cheerful tither, but said a cheerful giver. giver. Right. Yeah. So the tithing again, it's not a gift. It belongs to God. So, um, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. And I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses. Then you will always have everything you need. How do you think that's okay? You always have everything you need. And plenty. This is the definition of being blessed to me in the Word of God. Having everything you need and excess so you can bless somebody else. Hallelujah. To me, that is a blessing. Brother Gill. Uh-huh. Of course, the principle includes the tithe, yeah. but it's not speaking specifically alone of the tithe. It is speaking to any kind of gift. Any gift. Any gift. Any gift. And so part of these principles we're looking at, regularity, individually, in proportion, all of this is dealing with preparation, a heart that is prepared. And Gil, you bring that point out, that there is preparation beforehand, and Paul addresses that. Set it aside with regularity, that, per, that portion, and addressing the condition of the heart to where this is something that is, is not just a last-minute thing. And I, I've known people that uh, carry um, extra resources just so they can give it as offerings or alms. And uh, that's an awesome thing. And we had a family in the church for years. And if there was, you know, when we were working on the amphitheater, for example, I remember the gentleman coming up to me and said, Pastor, um, you know, how much, do, how much do you need to finish off uh, the wiring or the lights or this or that? And, um, and a lot of times I didn't know. I would have to check and see. And sometimes we didn't even know for sure exactly what we were going to need. But he would ask questions like that. Uh, or, or maybe he would say, uh, I heard you talking about painting. I uh, just wanted to let you know um, that we have a separate fund. It's, it's, it's from God's extra blessing. It's the extra blessing fund. And we have several hundred dollars in there. We're going to purchase the paint. Whatever it is, we'll just make it available. Don't say anything to anybody. He would always say that. Don't say anything to anybody. This is, is just God's extra blessing in our life. And that's beautiful. And some people do that. And some people in a service... Maybe there's a, a guest, or maybe God puts it on your heart. God's put it on my heart to give money to people that were in the church. You know, I didn't know anything about their needs, but God just directed me to go to them and, and give something to them. God may direct you like that at some time. And maybe some of you have helped people. Probably all of you have. And so uh, we need to be free to do that as God may direct us. Um, okay, and God, will give gen and God will generously provide all that you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. 
I like that part. Plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered how long? Does your Bible say something like forever? Is that a pretty long time? Yeah. Deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Some translations may say store but will increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. This is a lifestyle <laughs> that a mature believer ends up growing into. Many people have been in the church for years and they have never learned that God is faithful to provide. Yes, Gil. Amen. 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 And our righteousness is not established by what we give. But as righteous individuals, going back to this verse that I've gone to several times, because as I told you, this is not a verse that anyone really pointed out to me uh, in Deuteronomy 14, that you must set aside a tithe of your crops, one-tenth of all the crops you harvest, bring this tithe to the designated place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This applies to your tithe of grain, new wine, olive oil. This is 20, verses 22 and following, chapter 14. Doing this will teach you always to fear the Lord your God, and that is righteousness, being right before God and having a heart that can fully trust the Lord. There is a, a song that came to mind that I grew up singing this song. And the words go something like this. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. That's the first verse, this hymn. Second verse says, take my hands. And let them move at the impulse of thy love. Then speaks to the feet, take my feet, and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Swift. How many of you heard this hymn before? Swift and beautiful for thee. Now it comes to the voice. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my king. And remember, any noise from one of God's kids is a joyful noise. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee, filled with messages from thee. Now, so far we've been talking about body parts, right? It's not always so easy to do all of that and give all of that to God. But, but this is the hymn writer that's saying, I want to consecrate my life to God. But he's not finished. Not finished. Verse 4 says, Take my silver and my gold. Not, you know it, don't you, Ruddy? Not a mite would I withhold. What is he saying? He's saying it's all yours, God. It's all yours, God. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose, every power as thou shalt choose. Verse 5, take my will and make it thine, it shall no longer be mine. Sounds like the Lord's Prayer, doesn't it? Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Take my will, make it thine. It shall no longer be mine. Take my heart, it is thine own. Listen to this. It shall be thy royal throne. It's my heart. Take it. It shall be thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. And then the last verse, which many of these hymns had many verses, and there may even be more than I have coming up here, but verse 6, take my love, take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Great hymn, great hymn. When was the last time you heard a contemporary Christian song say anything about giving God all your money? Just think about it. When was, when was the, the last time you heard a contemporary Christian song talk about 100% life dedication, 100% surrender, of, of your will, your emotions, your hands, your feet. This is your life. It's your lifestyle. It's your livelihood. It's every aspect of your life. It's lordship, is it not? Bowing our knee and saying Jesus is Lord. Truly. Not just Jesus is Lord, but Jesus, you are my Lord. That rich young ruler couldn't do that because he was owned by his treasure. But the Lord wanted to give him all of his treasure, and God wants for his treasure to be available to us. The catch is we have to entrust to him what he gave us anyway. He gave it all to us. David said that. I love reading about David when he's bringing everything in, you know, and he has a record of all this stuff he's given. And I mean, you look at the amount of gold. It's amazing when you look at the amount of gold and silver and bronze and wood and all this stuff that's brought in, the tapestries, all the carvings, all the stuff that's done to build the temple, all this stuff's put together. And uh, Solomon, look at what David, Solomon, what can I give that God hasn't given me? And, and he's just establishing that reality that God has blessed me and I'm simply giving out of what he's given to me. And David chose to do it while he was alive. He laid aside his family's resources so that the temple would have the resources needed to build. Of course, the other leaders jumped in and were a part of that as well. I believe it's time for us to uh, kind of close up tonight. Did we touch on anything tonight that um, you believe is important for the church to talk about? What's one, one, thing, one thing we saw in the Word tonight? that uh, comes to mind. Patrick. Good. Amen. Giving's from the heart. And it, God made us to be givers. God made us to be givers. Regular, it, giver. regular givers. Yep. Yep. Cheerful giver. Thank you, Gil. Cheerful giver. Amen. Thank you, dear. <laughs> Amen. Anything else? All right. Well, may the Lord. Yes. This is one. <clears throat> um, as far as if you have a heart that wants to give, right? That's God wants you to mm -hmm. have. Um, mm -hmm. uh, be a cheerful giver. But yep. and willing. But in verse 10 of uh, chapter 9 of Second Corinthians, right? it says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply. Yep. The seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So, you know, if you have a heart that wants to give, yes. God is going to provide the seed so that you can sow. Amen. Amen. That's what you talked about when you Amen. spoke pledge. You know, Amen. you're asking the Lord, yep. you know, this is what I, you know, first of all, as, as human beings, it's not like we're such wonderful, uh, <laughs> open givers. <laughs> 
Now, Esther, you're saying that by nature we're not just going to want to give everything away. Now, that, that kind of picks on our humanity. So God touches the heart and creates that desire, but it comes does. from him. It all comes he does. from him. Even the desire to give comes from him. Amen. Amen. Then what happens to the fruit that was in the first time? Go to the first time. Yeah, what, what goes up he can have, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Patrick, good point, yeah. Whatever God wants, you can have. Well, if you don't want it, let it fall, you know, and like, okay, it, it fell back down here. Uh, and that kind, of, uh, that kind of shows the heart, doesn't it? <laughs> it kind of shows the heart. And back to where we started in, in Luke's gospel, um, that we do not give to get. We give because God is generous with us, and we can't. We can't. Uh, Tom Rouse used to say on Wednesday night he would come and he'd bring his violin and he had been out running into mailboxes or something. Tom, if you're watching, don't give me a hard time. But a couple, a couple days, he, you know, he'd have some tough days out dry, running the mail. But Tom would come in and he'd say, Pastor, do you know why I'm here? And I'd say, Tom, why are you here? Now I knew exactly what he was going to say because he'd said it many times. But he would always say the same thing. He said, because I can be. He said, because I can be. He said, I live in a nation where where I can come and worship God and I have a job where I get off and I can still make it and be a part with the worshipers. And he said, I want to. I want to. And I said, amen. That's, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, amen. Yes. I can remember a Christian that we used to go to this country for first time to win Jesus. Yes. I was a pastor from that time. We got mad for Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I don't believe it's a, it's a right yeah. thing to do because um, there are many persons who would have helped to, to one person to the Lord. Sure. But no one person single handedly um, led one to the Lord so they can be open eyes, open ears to see. Yeah. There are many persons who may have been doing that and we don't know. Sure. And so we come to full circle with our money believing that it is mine. Good point. It is my money. Good point. And when we, when we can understand that we own nothing. <laughs> Amen. So we don't personally own nothing. One of my particularities is that um, nobody robs me because I don't own anything. It is God's money. So if you rob me, you are only taking me up for some blessing. Taking God's money. Amen. Um, I don't hold on to things as if to say, this is mine. I work for this. And Amen. Uh, nobody's going to get it. I hold loosely onto things. Good. Because Very true, very true. Yeah, uh, Beit Shan in, in Israel, the ruins there, um, one of the articles that, that came out of the excavation, they found when they excavated a tightly wadded fist with a gold coin in it. And that city was destroyed by an earthquake. And this individual was buried in the rubble of their house. And, you know, the, the point was how many people's lives have been ruined by trying to save their wealth. Mm -hmm. And so they lost their life while they're trying to, yeah, right, save. And, uh, and I've, I've thought about that many times, that that's not just the case, uh, you know, in a, uh, in a ruins in Israel someplace, but that's the case. Uh, and the word says that, whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it, you know, and whoever findeth his life, uh, you know, shall lose it, you know, there's this principle of sur full surrender uh, to Christ, so, amen. Amen. If, if I may share this thought, sure. a, few, a, few, a few months, a few years ago, I remember when I had to go to Jamaica to try to start a commercial church. Yes, in, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in Hull. When I went out, I had spent a lot of money. Yep. Went to the port and to see some of yep. the store the church. Yep. And um, we were Some money that we go to school. Right. So, but God gave us that money. Mm. And we went out. About three weeks ago, we came in and we were making our way out from Jamaica. All the people from our community from our Catholic college and um, Catholic Catholic community school. We were starting the school and the school was charged in the church for um, all the students to own cars to come to. Mm. Uh, taking money to, to 
Sony Magic in the UK by Italy of Stephen Young and Stacey Ardy Turner in the UK as well. Mm. She was a poet for them. Amen. Amen. So that was that previous uh, situation where, where, you know, was caught. <laughs> Little praise report as we're closing tonight. This is the kind of daily Bible that I've been using for a lot of years. This is the second one I've worn out. I, um, and this one, I, I'm not sure it actually was a gift. Somebody found it. But when I was shopping for this, the least expensive, the, the lowest price I found was $80 a few years ago um, looking for one of these Bibles. And, you know, they, they made a jillion of these. There were a lot of these made, but it's been out of print for a number of years, uh, many years. And so the other morning, and, and this one is, uh, you know, it, it's just breaking apart and pages are coming out and stuff like that, and it's marked up all the way through. They last about 10 years. So the other morning when I was up for devotions, Clear as could be, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, um, go online and look for your Bible. Right now, right now. Ready? It's one of those right now things. So I went online, and my new one that I've just started using in my devotions cost less than $8. <laughs> less than $8. And, honey, you saw it. On the front page, on this page, which not in this one because it's full of God notes, but on the top page, there's somebody's name and what they bought it at a uh, library or something for $1. <laughs> so somebody, it doesn't look to me like anyone ever even read anything in it. So it's like brand new. But when I ordered that, then the enemy said, well, you just wait and see if it shows up. You've probably been ripped off. <laughs> I mean, that's just the devil. That's just the devil. You know, God directs you to do the smallest thing. And I know. I know some of you have experienced this. Pete, I know you've experienced some of these things. You know, God put something on your heart. So uh, I didn't say a whole lot about it until it came in the mail. <laughs> you know, I said, Lord, you know, I ordered that, you know, and, and it seemed too good to be real. And uh, the rest of the story is I did find another one that was close to the same price. My wife said, well, why didn't you buy that one too? <laughs> I'm like, I probably should have. But in the little things, the little things of our lives, we can trust God, and we can entrust ourselves to him. And that, that's probably not a thing of any interest to anybody else. But to me, it was like, thank you, Lord. It, it's just, it, it was like, I know I'm still hearing, and I know that God is still speaking. And God's favor, that's God's favor. And that happens how many times a week, a day, does God just show up in our lives and if we don't slow down a little bit, we might miss it. So we really need to um, to give God glory yeah, for that. Sometimes we think it's not a big deal that we don't need it right now. Or yeah, that. exactly. But God gives you the desires God knows. of your heart. God knows. And, and again, yeah, the absolutely. desire comes from Abso him. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, so now I, I guess I'm going to have to say when the Father says <laughs> to move again to buy the other Bible, because the, the enemy, uh, after the Bible came, you know what the next thing was the enemy said? What, are you only planning on living 10 more years? You know, they only last 10 <laughs> years. And uh, that lying devil, that lying devil, you know, it doesn't matter what God does. He's always trying to rain on your parade. So rejoice in the Lord and enjoy the goodness of him. Father, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness to fulfill your word in our lives. And Father, probably uh, every one of us in this room have had somebody uh, intentionally or maybe with a, uh, maybe not fully understanding uh, have in some way just ripped us off in some way at some time. And uh, yet, Father, you are the one that gives seed to the sower. So Father, I'm a sower. I believe there's sowers in this room tonight. And you give seed to the sower. It doesn't say that you give seed to the hoarder. You don't, or you give seed to the consumer, but it says you give seed to the sower. So, Father, I desire to continue to be a generous giver, a generous sower in your kingdom, 
and one that is blessed so I can continue to be a blessing to others, even in a greater increasing, increasing way. In Jesus' name, may your people be blessed. Amen.